Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to another edition of Truce from the Gateway. I'm Pastor William Boyd Bingham. So very glad that you've joined me from right here in the heart of Appalachia. And of course, we've not been back face to face in our worship services. And so I could go back and get old sermons and play them for you and old programs and all that kind of stuff. But I want to speak a word, as the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 50, a word in season a word particularly designed for the time that we're living in. And of course, I know that most of you realize that we are in a national crisis and not only a crisis physically, now we're going to experience a financial crisis. And here in our church, where I've been pastor for 45 years now, I've tried to be submissive, cooperative with the powers that be, respecting those that have the authority over us, I'm trying to do that respectively. And as long as we are respected, I'm going to try to my very best to be respectful. And the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 13 about how that we're to be submissive to the authorities that, that we are under at this present time, the governmental authorities. And I, I want to do that as long as we can. I want to be protective of our community. I want the church to be blameless. I want to be protective of the vulnerable. And I've got people in my own congregation that are going through chemo treatments and they want to be back in the house of God and I want to be back in the house of God. And I know that there are those that say today, well, the church is just a building. That's just a building. The church is the people. I know scripture. I understand that very clearly that we make up the body, the building and the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not a novice in the word of God. Been doing this for some time now and was raised in it all of my life, and that from a child, I have known the Holy Scriptures. But there's nothing that compares with meeting in the designated place where God's tithes and offerings that people have given have built an edifice, a house for the glory of God. And it's not designed for entertainment, and it's not designed just for a place to socialize. It's designed for the promotion of the gospel, the preaching of the word, the discipleship of believers, the edification of those that are walking by faith and not by sight. And that's what this building is all about. It's God's house. It's not my house. It's the Lord's house. And we gather at the Lord's house. You'd say, you've got no background for that. Oh my, I've been all over Israel and every year in Israel, they are discovering more and more synagogues. And they are uncovering those with the archaeological discoveries. It's amazing. There's a place now that you can visit the Sea of Galilee for you that have been there. It's called Magdala. It's just back up the coastline of the Sea of Galilee from Capernaum. And of course, we've known about Jesus having his missionary headquarters at Capernaum down to our studies of the scripture. That was the place that he resorted to often in his three and a half year earthly ministry. It was like a headquarters for him. But then the synagogue at Magdala. It is absolutely beautiful. And there's others that are being discovered archaeologically. And it's amazing. It's called the meeting place, the place of convocation. I know the early church, they had to meet in houses and they went from house to house. And they broke their bread with gladness, singleness of heart, and having favor with all men at that particular time. And they were in one accord. There was symphonia. But now at this particular time of the church age, we have the opportunity to gather in the Lord's house. And what a privilege. And all oh, even the little children in our community. And we bring them in on the buses. And many of them are so underprivileged. And we try to meet their needs, most of all loving them, making sure that they're not a church orphan. And then their physical needs, oh my, we feed them every time they walk through these doors. And it blesses me when a little child here in Appalachia looks up at this building as they're riding on a bus and I help bring them in from time to time. And they'll say, that's my church. That's my church. And I know the church is more than a building. But for that child, they've got a connection. They've got a place of worship. They've got a place where they feel welcomed. A place where they feel 
love. The story is told about a little boy in Chicago, Illinois, years ago, the Windy City. And on a cold, blustery Sunday morning, he was walking. And one policeman after the other stopped him and said, it's too cold to be out here, young man, too cold. He said, I'm going to church. Well, you just passed three churches. Where are you going? He said, I'm going to Moody's church. Talking about D.L. Moody. He said, why are you going to Moody's church for? He said, they love me there. And that's what we want to do. We want to love them here and let this be their connection. Let this be the paradigm of their life. And all many of them that are gone through our Christian school and they're older now, they'll come back and they'll say to me, Preacher, the happiest days of my life were right there. And I've never been able to get away from it. There's something now about a church edifice, a building that's been uh, ordained, set apart for nothing but the preaching of the Word of God, the evangelizing of the lost, and the edification of believers. Well, I, I got on a little sermon there, but I'm talking about one day we're going to be able to gather again, but there's something that's disturbing me that a lot of people are looking to blame the church, a lot of governmental officials. And so we know that we have the right to assemble, and so I'm watching something. We need to be prepared for the coming persecution. Great little booklet by Dr. Adrian Rogers. And Jesus said, you can know that you belong to me. The world hated me. And if the world hated me, then the world, this system without God against God, this system that doesn't have the knowledge of God. They're going to persecute the church. And so we need to be ready for it. This great little booklet, write to me. I'll get it out to you to be a blessing to you. People love the little magnetic cross. They absolutely love it. Write to me. I'll send that to you along with how to handle persecution, how to prepare for persecution. The only thing you have to do is write. I'll get it out to you. Let's pray for one another. I'm coming back with a Bible message. But right now, a great gospel song. I believe you're going to be blessed. And then I'll be back with today's Bible message. Stay tuned.
My, what a powerful song. And that's exactly what we need at this present time. So many people are asking me, Pastor, what should we do right now with the national crisis? And I'm going through a financial crisis. What should I do? I tell you, every child of God needs to do what we should have already been doing. And I think that many have. We need to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You know that I've said on the program over and over again that we've arrived at a time that we almost have a crossless and a Christless Christianity. But I want to do my very best to preach him. And I want to tell about his sacrificial, substitutionary death for us on the cross. That's the message that the world has always needed to hear. And we need to hear it today even more so. The Bible says in the 12th chapter of the book of the Hebrews, beginning at verse 1, Seeing then that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Jesus is the one that we need to look to. And at this present time, he's not only the one that we need to look to, he's the one that we need to be looking for. A lot of people are asking the question, is this a sign of the end time? I believe with all of my heart that the Lord has lifted the curtain and given us a preview of what's to come. And we need to take it seriously. But yet, in the midst of all that, it's still our duty, our responsibility, our wonderful privilege, and it is the pathway to peace to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In the previous messages, I've tried to show you that He is our anchor of hope. He's our anchor of hope even in troublesome times. According to Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, we have hope and anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. And then we hold to the promise that He's given us in the 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews, verses 5 and 6. Let your lives be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we might boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That's what we need right now. We need the hope of the Lord's help. We need to look unto Jesus. There's not enough preaching about him. There's not enough teaching about him. We need to look at him, examine him, consider him. And when Paul says there in Hebrews chapter 12, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. You know what he's saying? He's saying, examine him. Like John, when he introduced him in John chapter 1 at verse 29, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You know what he was saying? Scrutinize him. Examine him. Autopsy him. He's exactly who he says he is. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. It is the power of God. Uh, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent, of how people think that they're going to get to heaven. A lot of people, oh, they're using the balancing act. They think if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then everything's going to be all right. And I know that the Lord's going to let me enter in. Listen to what Jesus said. Here's the reason that we need to look to him. John chapter 14 at verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts chapter 4 at verse 12, and Peter preaches and listen to what he says. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. That's the only way. That's the only name. And that's the reason that we're looking unto Jesus. 
the one that designed our faith and the one that finished our faith. And it's finished in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. The sixth saying of Jesus from the cross, right before he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, Jesus said, it is finished. John chapter 19 at verse 30, the debt has been paid. And so listen to what Paul says in verse 23. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block. Under the Greeks it's foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Let's look unto Jesus. He is our hope, the anchor of our hope. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. Let's look unto Jesus. He is our helper. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. And we can boldly say that He will never leave us and He will never forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let's look unto Him. Do you know Him today? Listen to what the world needs to hear about Jesus. They need to hear the truth that Jesus preexisted and was co-equal with the Father in eternity past. You'd say, Pastor, can you prove that? I certainly can. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him is life, and this life is the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not, or the darkness could not stop him. He pre-existed with the Father. We say Jesus, the Son of God. But remember, he's not only Jesus, the Son of God, he is Jesus, God himself. Not only the Son of God, but he is God, one in the same. The same in the beginning was with God, pre-existing and co-equal with God. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now listen, after all these years of preaching, I've determined that I'm going to preach Christ, Him crucified, risen again, and the only mediator between God and men. Let me see if I can enumerate them for you for just a moment. I believe that it'll be a blessing to you. You might want to write to me and get a DVD or a CD and listen to this over and over again. I believe that Jesus preexisted and was co-equal with the Father in eternity past and even now, but He was willing to become flesh. He became incarnate. So we believe that Jesus pre-existed and co-equal with the Father. We believe that Jesus is the motivation for creation. All there in John chapter 1. And it says that all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Colossians chapter 1 at verse 16, again the Bible says all things made by Him and for Him. And it even goes a little bit further in verses 17 and 18 of Colossians chapter 1. And by Him all things consist. Jesus is the motivation. And He is the consistency of creation. Why do you think that the devil introduced this fallacy of evolution so that we would get our minds and hearts away from the Creator. So we believe that He pre-existed, co-equal with the Father. We believe that He's the motivation for creation. And then we believe in the incarnation, again, John chapter 1, 1 through 5, and then in verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. And Matthew puts it this way, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, uh, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. This is the sign that Isaiah gave 700 years before he was born. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a child, a man-child, 
and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, from Isaiah 7 and 14, God with us. We believe that he preexisted and was co-equal with the Father. We believe that he was the motivation for creation. We believe in the incarnation that the Word, God the Son, he became flesh and dwelt among us. We believe in his sinless perfection. John the Baptist again said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. One of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at verse 21. And listen to what the Bible says. Uh, he knew no sin. And he who knew no sin, he was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. Peter says he did no sin. And then again, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 5, that no sin was found in him. I need to go further with this in the days ahead. So listen to what we believe about Jesus. We believe that he preexisted and was co-equal with the Father. We believe that he's the motivation for creation. We believe that Jesus became incarnate in human form, lived among us, Emmanuel. We believe in his sinless perfection. He was the absolute accepted sacrifice and that leads us to the crucifixion. And we believe that he had to die. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. For without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. And from Genesis chapter 3 all the way to Revelation we see the blood trail in the word of God. Adam and Eve sinned and God made them coverings of skins. And that means that God shed the blood of an innocent animal so that they would be covered. A typology, a picture of salvation. And then in Revelation chapter 5, they're searching through heaven to find one worthy, one worthy to take the scroll and to loose the seals thereof, the end time plan of God. And for Jesus again, uh, to re-own uh, or be reinstated as the rightful heir of heaven and earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And we're just tenant farmers. We're just living here on this planet that belongs to Him. And He's coming back to regain it and to recapture it and to reestablish Himself that He is the Lord of the earth and the fullness thereof. And they're looking for one that is worthy. And all one of the elders went to John when he was weeping because none were found worthy and said, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, he had prevailed to take the scroll, loose the seals thereof. Revelation chapter 5. And John said, I expected to see the champion. I expected to see one like David. There is a conquering king. But when I turned, I saw as if it were a lamb that had been slain. You see, we see the blood trail. The crucifixion was a necessity. The life of the flesh in Leviticus 17, 11, is in the blood. And Jesus shed his blood, an atonement for our sin, and fulfilled the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. And there need not be another lamb to be slain. Jesus has fulfilled the plan of God once and for all. And even as we find Abraham declaring to Isaac, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. Well, we know that God has provided himself a lamb. And through the blood of that lamb, he now can see me and see you. If you've accepted him, you see it's like Egypt and how that the Israelites were in bondage for 430 years and the 10th plague of the death of the firstborn. But if you've got the blood of a spotless lamb on the doorpost of your home, he says, when I see the blood, Exodus 12, verse 13, I will pass over you. So I ask you today, is the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus, has it been applied? Have you said, forgive me, cleanse me, wash me. I know that I've sinned and I repent of my sin. I know that I can't save myself and my good deeds can outweigh my bad deeds. You paid it all for me and I'm trusting in you and you alone. I'm looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith today. And I'm trusting your shed blood as the covering for my sin. And then death will pass over you. You'd say, well, pastor, we still have to die physically, but that's not a spiritual death of being eternally separated from God. 
And today it's offered to you. And I offer to you even now. I pray that you'll turn to him. Look unto Jesus today. He's our answer in troublesome times. Always has been, always will be. He is our anchor of hope. And we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. Father, I pray today that you would speak to everyone that's been listening and watching. And Lord, do your great work in their heart and life by the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I ask in Jesus' high and holy name, amen.